Hello, my name is Rich Howard, owner of Architectural Builder Supply, and this video is to bring you a closer look at the Tectus. This is their part number TE 5263D. This is in a stainless steel, but this is a really special variant. It's a 316 alloy stainless for ultra superior corrosion resistance uh, is where the 316 is being used. Uh, this hinge is in particular being used in a rail terminal system, a uh, public transportation system in, in the Middle East. And the application calls for hardware that's going to bring to bear the highest corrosion resistance possible. We have supplied other material on this project which has been requested to conform with the highest level of water intrusion water resistance, waterproofing is possible. So I don't know if these hinges are actually installed in an exterior application where they're going to take um, exposure directly to moisture, to the elements, but with 316 stainless there is no greater corrosion resistance possible. And the short version is that this 316 hinge, uh, stainless steel being an alloy uh, containing you know different base materials, 316 versus 304. 316 contains 2% molybdenum, and it's the inclusion of that 2% molybdenum that gives it its outrageously superior resistance to chemical attack, to salt spray, to uh, resisting fatigue and failure from moisture. Um, also, let's see here. We would also add to that... Uh, uh, salt in the air, seawater. Okay, so in the coastal area where we are here in Florida, being literally four miles from the ocean, the the salt's going to be in the air everywhere. Um, so that would be a those areas where you're going to seek to use 316. There's a link in our website. If you would like to know more about the difference between 304 and 316, manufacturers page, if you click the term, the link manufacturers, you'll be able to pull up all of the manufacturers we sell. And if you search for ABS, Architectural Builder Supply, just ABS, there will be on that page uploaded a document that will allow you to review uh, the stainless steel for coastal and salt corrosion uh, applications. It's a guide, it talks about 304 or 316. This, this client needed 316, that's what they had to have, and there they go. Uh, substantial upgrade, and certainly in terms of lead time and, and, and most definitely in terms of cost as well. Let's move on to uh, Simon's work and their Tectus hinge overview. Now the Tectus hinge by Simon's work, uh, a German company, is a series of hinges that uh, are basically a completely concealed hinge system. And here in the United States, we certainly do have concealed hinges. Uh, what does set this Tectus hinge apart is your ability to adjust it. Um, and that can be a very attractive option to a lot of people. In my experience, when you're dealing with concealed hinges um, or you're dealing with pivot hardware, floor closers, overhead closers, you don't have any ability to contend with a misalignment after you've prepped the door and frame. What I'm thinking of on a concealed hinge that we're all familiar with that would be by an American manufacturer, the back set that you install it in the frame and the door, the vertical height you apply it at, once you make those preparations, the, 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 the mold is cast uh, is, is, the, is, is the bottom line. There's no shimming it in any direction. Similarly with a floor closer, once you install that top pivot and you drop your plumb bob down, that vertical axis of pivoting, once you place that floor closer body, the mold is cast. There's no ability to move that. The only thing that you can kind of do in that scenario is to put a shim, and floor closers will include shims, where you can literally just pad it up a little bit, a sixteenth, an eighth of an inch, but that's all. The Tectus system has 3D in the part number, which refers to the, which refers to their ability to adjust vertically, um, adjust the position of the leaf in the door, and then also affect 
the depth on the frame portion as well, and we're going to go over that in a moment. The Tectus hinge system, um, its summary uh, is basically this. You're going to be dealing with a... You're going to be dealing with a hinge system that's going to give you um, a concealed sort of aspect. It's going to give you uh, flush fitting. When the door, uh, the door and frame, everything fits completely flush, you're going to be able to handle load capacities that are generally, that are not generally, that are well beyond a typical butt hinge is the bottom line. 30 pardon me, 60 to 300 kilograms. Well, that's kilograms. So 2.2 pounds per kilogram, I believe, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you're going to get that 3D adjustment, which we'll go over in a moment. Opening angles up to 180 degree, unless you have some sort of conflict. Uh, you can, th through the Tectus system, uh, order hinges that are going to be able to give you the ability to handle lots of different scenarios. Standard installation. You know, you've got a rabbited frame, you've got a standard door thickness, standard rabbit pocket. They also make a hinge where you can... They also make a hinge where, in your mind's eye, you've got your door and a frame, your door and your frame, except that the door stands proud of the frame because they want the drywall to come right up with a outside bead, a corner bead, right up flush to the face of the door. So they've got a hinge that's staggered. I actually sold three of those yesterday. Uh, they give you the ability to add um, cladding to the door, door and frame. So they've got these other hinges. And there's only, I'm guessing there's only maybe 12 models, so there's not really that many to look at. Uh, you can apply these to wood, steel, or aluminum type applications. And these hinges uh, provide maintenance-free uh, sort of uh, life span. They specifically tell you, do not oil the hinge. Hinge, you're going to destroy the hinge. Don't lubricate it. Don't do nothing. It doesn't require any of that stuff. And we'll take a closer look at that in a moment. Um, there, according to the manufacturer, there's a certain appeal in designing items in such a way where their actual value was initially in the background, thereby giving space to other elements. Flush mounting is a stylistic principle that exudes minimalism and involves precise technology and perfection. The Tectus series of concealed hinges offers unsurpassed quality, versatility, and depth. The completely concealed hinge system Tectus has been an integral part of the Simon's work range since 2002, and I know Simon's work has been in business for well over 100 years. Continually developed, uh, they state that the Tectus hinge is as, as, uh, as or greater than, uh, more efficient and more uh, innovative than it has ever been. There is a link below this video to the manufacturer's page where you will be able to view the entire product catalog. Um, and what really, I would say, sets these hinges apart is twofold. The fact that they're concealed, and that's really cool. Um, hardware, um, as it just said, as the manufacturer states, sometimes it's better to where you don't see it. And uh, I would not disagree with that. Um, sometimes hardware is to be presented, and there are other times when it's not to be presented. To be presented would be the te uh, the Texas Capitol building in Austin has some hinges <clears throat> that are well over 100 years old and could be 140 years old. I forget when that building was built. Late second, 1870-ish, don't quote me. Well, they have some wide throw hinges that have engravings done on each leaf have gorgeous steeple tips, and these hinges are literally irreplaceable. You're going to showcase that hardware. The other end of the spectrum is a project that we've just recently done. Not, not this project on these 316 stainless hinges, but we just did a Tectus uh, one or two openings for the facade of a high-end retailer in Manhattan. Uh, man, uh, a retailer 
that's going to uh, be synonymous with mostly women's, but men's handbags and things of that nature. One or two doors on their facade that those doors are mandatory because of life safety code. The ability to exit the building. Um, on the inside, we've got panic devices. No problem with that. But if you've ever walked through Manhattan or any high-end area uh, that's going to feature shops like that, they don't want to see a barrel of a hinge, okay? <laughs> or a continuous hinge. So the Technus hinge that we used was perfect because we were adding cladding, we had a very heavy door, and we didn't want to see the hardware. The fact that it was adjustable was certainly a bonus, but because the steel door and frame were manufactured for the job, in my argument, it would not, ought not to have been a requirement whatsoever that the client adjust it, but that ability was there. Um, these hinges are used in high-end residential, absolutely. High-end commercial, heavy-duty commercial. Um, available in lots of different finishes. And we're going to go over that in a moment. The rest of the catalog then moves on to talk about, or just to show some photographs of typical applications of hardware. And it is awfully nice to not see hinges, even though some of the doors in, this, in, in their images swing in, so you're not going to see them anyway. But the fact of the matter is, they're not there. There's no projecting hardware. They do have a power transfer hinge, uh, which I've not used in the past only because I found a limitation of its ability to handle the inrush required by a certain exit device manufacturer's inrush requirements that were very high um, and the power uh, transfer <clears throat> the energy hinge from Tectus was not able to handle that so we went with a traditional power transfer still concealed. Now uh, they can also do um, hinges that have integrate, integrated into mesons, and that's either going to, that's most certainly going to be because it's required during the manufacturing process to be compliant with the particular fire rating in play. The catalog goes on to show some additional uh, hinge images and then s talk about their A8 version where they're going to make some cladding and you need to have a specialized hinge for that. Uh, moving on through that catalog, they move on to talk about all the different models. And this video is not going to talk about all the different models. We're going to focus on only the model that we are working on here, which is TE-526 again. Okay, So let's move on now to a visual overview of this hinge. Now let's continue on with a visual overview of this hinge. So this is the TE-526 3D. This is what the hinge looks like when it comes out of the box. Um, and this is the 316 version. Apparently there's no way to know um, if this is 304 or 316 by looking at it. Uh, there are, I have noticed that sometimes there is a stamping on it. Um, I don't know if this is the manufacturer stamping on it, confirming the 316 stainless. A certificate of conformance, of course, um, accompanies this material, attesting from the manufacturer that it is stainless steel and 316. But this is visually what the hinge looks like. You have your um, frame portion, which we know because of the two and two screws, we have our door portion, one screw, one screw. That, that's how I visually identify it. Else, What else is in the box is going to be your finished plates. A total of four, obviously, top and bottom for each leaf if it's appropriate to call these leaves, or each side of the hinge. It's just beautiful. You're going to have 
two of the hinges are going to be stamped with the manufacturer's information. Okay, the other two are just simply going to be blank. It's going to cover that off. And you get the concept of where this is going. Obviously, I'm going to finish that off as well. Okay. So you'll get your cover plates. Then you're going to get your screw package. You're going to have Now, what we're looking at here is the screw package uh, moving next, and on this project, I, when you place your order for your hinges, specify in the comment field um, exactly your application. Their instructions say they can do aluminum, they can do steel, or they can do wood. Okay, fine. The bottom line is this. I'm sure that they can, but the packaging the screws that are in the packaging do not permit that to happen. So rather than leave any guesswork involved or delays, specify what your application is on, is on the door and frame. In this screw package, we've got eight wood screws. That's good. If you're doing a wood door and a wood frame, I can't see why you would with a Type 316 stainless, but you're all set. The problem that's occurred here, and we're rectifying this problem with the vendor now, is they only sent four machine screws. This is a metal by metal application. Okay, they've only sent four machine screws, which are a Torx style screw. Okay, so that's the issue with that. The other screws that are in the package are the four small finish screws for your plates. Okay, four of these little screws are also included. Define what you need in terms of packaging. Again, I can't fathom. I mean, it wasn't specified, no question. However, a Type 316 stainless, they're not paying that extra money for corrosion resistance to stick them on interior wood door, wood frame applications. It's just what I'm thinking. So we've exhausted everything in the package except these mystery pieces. Well, at least they were mystery pieces to me. Um, I actually had to call the factory and ask what these were for. Okay, so the bottom line is I got the answer. In your mind's eye, visualize when you make the preparation in the door, in the door and the frame on both sides. And then if you were to make that preparation and then look at the door and frame, you then install the hinge. If you were to open the door up, you're going to exceed the exposed area of the cutout. So they literally send these little liners for you to place on the inside of your cutouts to just give yourself that look right there. Okay? Without that, you're going to see your cut. With it, it looks finished. Okay? That's what these are for. They are a peel away paperback adhesive material and a complementary finish. Not exact, but you know, on the inside of a frame cutout, certainly going to be a lot darker, certainly going to be a lot more appropriate to what you're doing. That is a visual overview of the item. We're going to move to a catalog page and dimensional overview of this hinge next. Okay, now let's talk about the catalog page. And there's a link below this video to the product catalog where you can review it. The TE-526 3D is literally a model for unrabbited, or they call it rebated, heavy-duty doors made of solid stainless steel. That's the TE-526. On that catalog page, there is a cross-section of what is being shown. And when they're saying unrebated, um, that term is going to apply to the fact of what we would know as inset, or at least what I would know as inset. If you stood on the pull side of your door and you ran your door over the face of the door and frame, most doors, hollow metal doors, wood doors, steel frames, some aluminum, the doors kicked in a little bit, 
three thirty second of an inch, something like that. Some aluminum and applications where you would want an unrebated hinge, the door and the frame are flush together. Really important. Um, because if you use the wrong hinge and you're inset, it's not going to line up. Your door is going to not, your door will hang. It's just not going to hang in the right depth of the frame pocket. So that's where we're using this model of hinge. Um, moving through the rest of the product features, material stainless steel, concealed hinge system for timber, steel, or aluminum, wood, steel, aluminum. For unrebated heavy-duty doors, 3D adjustments, we're going to go over that in a moment, maintenance-free, load capacity. We're going to talk in depth about load capacity because they have their own document, 120 kilograms for two hinges. 120 times 2.2 tells us that we're dealing with a 264 pound door. Um, yeah, 2.2 pounds per kilogram. I am of the age where metric was not the system that we were taught in school, so I have to check my memory. 264 pound door on two of these freaking hinges. That is a substantial amount of weight. Okay, that shows you how incredibly capable hinges like this are. Um, obviously, if you know, most installations are going to have three hinges. Um, this client, I'm not sure how many they're doing uh, hinge wise on each door, but I can tell you um, that the quantity of hinges they have ordered uh, is certainly not conducive to having three hinges on a door it's likely they're doing just two or possibly four but the fact of the matter is they're probably doing two hinges on a door the ability of it to carry load is significantly enhanced when you add a third hinge they tell us when you're adding a third hinge to refer to the door manufacturer um, you might need to determine exactly what the increase in capacity is by adding a third hinge, I would certainly argue that you're going to pick up a third additional weight capacity as a, at a minimum um, of that. They tell us the location of where you place it does not affect its capacity to carry a load, which I, in my untrained um, understanding, would disagree with. 70% of the weight of the door is held on that top hinge. If I've got two at the top, that's going to give me a greater ability to handle a load better than having top, middle, bottom would be my logic and is the way that I've been trained. Overall length now, let's get into overall length. Uh, we're going to get into a dimensional review of the hinge now. <clears throat> They've got an overall length of 155 millimeters. That's basically six and an eighth. You know, millimeters divided by 25.4, you can convert that. The width is basically one inch, just heavy on an inch, 26 millimeters. They say that your margin between the two leaves when you're open at 180 degrees is supposed to be 15 millimeter. So I'm going to go where something in the 5 eighths range. Okay, 11 sixteenths, let's say. Uh, opening angle, 180 degree. Provided you don't have any problem with uh, conflict of casing of, of the wall condition. Shouldn't be with the wall condition. You're doing a flush, unrebated condition. As long as you don't have any casing applied outside or it's not very thick, it'd have to be quite small, but you'll have no problem going to 180 degree. Cutting diameter 24 millimeter. I think they're talking about what we're going to prep this for. And we're going to get into a machining uh, fitting installation review. Um, the catalog page talks about finishes. They can do your 040 finish, which they call satin finish, which is what this is. They can do a polished in 042. You want 316 with a polished, they can do it. You want colored 079. I don't know what that means, except that there's obviously some process done on the base material. Thinking powder coating. If you want white over 316, I'm sure that they can accommodate that. 
Um, I'm guessing that 079 colored means tell us what color and we will work towards that. There is a listing of installation tools um, that we'll talk about later. Functional areas, fire resistance, smoke resistance, soundproof, burglar resistant. So they're talking about the applications where you'll see this. This is, speaking of fire resistance and smoke resistance, this is specifically list uh, stamped, UL listed. So that's what your inspector is going to be looking for when it comes to uh, a sh uh, uh, being absolutely sure that this product is correctly installed on doors, meaning this is applied to a fire-rated door and frame application. And it carries the mark that tells the inspector that this has been tested for a fire-rated application. Note, the load capacity mentioned above refers to the use of two hinges, one by two uh, millimeter, what, uh, meter. What they're meaning there is they've got a logic that basically says for every two of door height, they're calculating a one of width. So if you had an eight foot tall door, they're saying four foot wide. Seven foot tall door, it's obviously gonna be just some, you know, three and a half uh, door wide, door width. Um, so if you're using a, if you're putting these on a door that's 3070, you're below their load capacity uh, outline because it's not two to one in that regard. With an opening position of 180 degree, the door may have to be fixed additionally also available in 316 stainless. With an opening position of 180 degree, the door may have to be fixed additionally. I think what they're saying, and this wasn't written in English in my, as a first language would be my guess. I think what they're saying is if you're going to 180 degrees, let's get templating to make sure that this is going to work. Show us a cross section. Show us a wall detail. Show us what, what's being done in the factory. We'll make a recommendation, not only for the quantity of hinges, but also for uh, the hinge type itself. That's what I would go with on that. So we've gone over the catalog page. We're going to next move to the uh, machining and preparation that you're going to do. But first, let's finish up just a quick dimensional review of the product. Without its end caps, you know, just throwing the tape measure around, half of the body is going to be about an inch and a quarter. You know, width of the body, it's going to be just shy on an inch, maybe seven eighths. Height of the back plate itself looks like we're about four inch, about three and three quarter, three and seven eighths from here to here. Okay, that's all going to come into play when we talk about our mortising for this, which is really simple and straightforward. The prep for this is really easy. And again, they make templates, which we'll talk about. Okay, we're going to move on to the installation aspect of it now. Now let's talk about the fitting instructions, what they call fitting. <clears throat> we would call it machining, installation instructions, your template. They call it fitting instructions. Some people call it fixing. I've heard it termed fixing. Um, although maybe the word fixing means to physically apply or to alter something that's been done um, or to tighten, whatever. Um, whether it be German or Chinese, a little bit of lost in translation because I think they translate it literally and not by a na native speaker. But the point of the matter is this. Let's talk about how to install the material. Um, there is a link below this video talking about the fitting instructions. They are not telling us in that document what sort of location they like. So let's search out that information. Okay, so there is a link to a document called Load Capacities. The load capacity tells us <clears throat> if you have doors that are smaller than 8 foot, they want from the top of the door to the center of the hinge, 10 inch. They want from the bottom of the door to the center of the hinge, 10 inch. If you do doors that are greater than or equal to or greater than eight foot, they're showing a hinge to be in the middle of the door on their load capacity. 
um, on their load capacity document. That document also tells us to increase the load capacity of the hinges, a third hinge needs to be positioned 14 inch center to center, top 10 inch center, 14 center to center, below the upper hinge, center to center. The use of a third hinge in order to increase the load capacity has, has to be determined on a case by case basis. Our hinge data refers to the height width ratio of two to one please contact the manufacturer for further information and also see the door manufacturer's instructions. Proper preparation and alignment as well as tension-free adjustment are crucial for a hassle-free operation. Absolutely. The bottom line is this. You know that you've got a weight rating of two hinge, for two hinges up to 264 pounds, I think we said. You're going to add a third hinge, most likely not because of the weight of the door, but because you need to have a hinge in the middle of the door, at least one, to be compliant with your wood door manufacturer or your steel door manufacturer's warranty requirement so as to consider the door properly hung in case of warp. So it's likely that you're going to put a third hinge just because you're concerned about um, running afoul of the manufacturer's published data when it comes to properly hanging a door. Meaning, if you're doing doors that are center hung, center hung pivots, if that door were to warp, did you know the door manufacturer, the wood door manufacturer, will disallow a warranty claim? And that's because they don't consider the door properly hung. So if you're doing an American door, American application, I would investigate, I would contact the manufacturer of that door and say, listen, I'm planning on doing Tectus hinges. Are you okay with two? If not, what are you okay with in case of warp? You don't want to buy the door to find out that you've improperly, improperly hung the door and it's warped. They're going to require that hinge or hinges in the middle to help keep the door in the door pocket or in the door rabbit. So be mindful of that. If you're in Europe, you're going to see two hinges at the top. Or if you're on a cruise boat, which is made not in the United States, which I think is all of them, um, like a large cruise line, all your doors are going to have two hinges at the, at the top. Top, right below, soldier stacked. Then you're third at the bottom, so be mindful of that. My opinion, and I don't know because I've not reached out to the factory, is again, you're going to pick up a third, if not more, load capacity. I'm sure that if you continue to throw hinges at the door, you're going to continue to increase its ability to hold weight, um, etc. Now, uh, the fitting instructions, looking at that document, And I'm looking for our dimensional properties. Here they are. Routing data is what it's really called. When I'm looking at the routing data for the T526, the TE526, it's all in millimeter. Hey, listen, it's the year 2018. We can't hide behind the fact we didn't learn it. we got to convert it. Divide by 25.4. Uh, as you can see, it's a really simple preparation, although it doesn't appear that way when you initially look at it, and I understand that. Certainly, when I was very new to routing material, this would have been highly difficult. However, after you do it the first time, it's no longer highly difficult. And think of it in context. And everything that I've ever machined can be done in either one step, two step, and very occasionally three steps. What I mean is, consider a butt hinge. You're going to put your router down. You're going to go... Uh, you know, you're going to go X and you're going to go Y one depth. That's a one-step situation. Okay, this is no different, except that it's a two-stepper. You're going to do this prep, and then you're going to come back and do this prep. We would call that plate and body. You're going to do your body prep first, like, a, like the hinge I said earlier, the butt hinge. That's just a plate. That's literally only the plate. Well, this is a two-step deal where you're going to route to fit the body in, which is just what I'm tracing out in my with my finger. And then, once you've got the body prep done, reset your router, now do the entire plate. I like to work from the deepest part first, so that when I'm lifting my router out, assuming that I'm not running it on a CNC piece of equipment, if I nick anything, well, I can come back and clean it with my plate prep. So I never do my finished work 
first. I always do it last. When we study the routing data for the 526, um, without converting it all with a calculator, um, the body prep on the left-hand side, uh, we're dealing with 102 millimeters. And that is going to give us what we need to fit this in here to here. So, I mean, four inch, right? 102 millimeters. Um, you've got a radius of 12 millimeter they want. Okay. Uh, not quite one inch, but awfully close. Um, the fact that they want a 26 millimeter wide preparation which is just heavy on one inch. Uh, yeah, you're probably going to need to invest in specialty size router bits for doing this. Um, could you probably, could you make a 13 millimeter radius bit work and do your plate preparation? I don't see why not. I don't know what the true radius of this piece is. You might have to finish it by hand, but we're talking one millimeter here. When you mortise for stuff with your experience, you'll be able to learn what tool you can use and how you can, if at all, deviate from the template to just accommodate the tools you already own. Starting from scratch, I would be purchasing a 12, a 24 millimeter diameter bit, and I would do my body prep with that so that I would get my uh, proper radiuses. However, if you don't have a template, you've not bought one, or you've not made one your own, on your own, what I would do is I would get a 12 millimeter radius or a 24 millimeter bit, and I would drill down in those two places. Then I would take my router with any old router bit, and I would just clean that pocket up, and I would go down to the proper depth, which according to our document is 33 millimeter. Okay. Now you've got the body prep done. 102 millimeter wide, 12 millimeter radius, 33 millimeter deep. Now reset. Come with your tw your 13 millimeter, your 26 millimeter diameter bit. Mm, not really, because they want you to use that same 12 millimeter radius or 24 millimeter bit for not only the prep here, but the prep here as well. So you're going to do that same prep just to the depth that you need. A Forstner bit concept is really awfully nice. What's really awfully nice for these is to buy the template from the factory because it gives you, you can make them your own on your own, and I've done that countless times, but when you're dealing with metric and you don't have the tooling already and you have to purchase that stuff to make your own template, you might just buy it. Um, although I find that I like my homemade templates better because they're more durable. Um, you know, I can... I can make them in such a way where I do less work. I might physically make them so I don't have to measure anything but one dimension. You might, and I'm not familiar with this template, but you might make an L-shaped template where you just have to chalk it up to the face of the door, set it down, and then go about your routing. Whatever. Now you're going to do your plate prep. You've got to have the same 12 millimeter radius, top and bottom. Now you're going 155 millimeter overall height, 10 millimeter thick, <clears throat> and that's obviously going to give you the thickness that you require. Now, here's where all of it needs to be thought out. The preparation that you're going to do in the frame, 10 millimeter, look to the right, 6 millimeter. You're going to immediately compare everything. So all we've talked about is just what you'll do in the frame. You're going to need to compare everything on the door portion to make sure that nothing deviates. And our length of our body and our plate are the same. Our depth is a little bit different. And our, and our plate thickness is different. It's only 6 millimeter. But that's literally how you're going to prep for this. It sounds difficult. The first time you do, it's a hassle. The second's not so bad. By the time you do in the third through the twelfth, it's easy money. Probably buy the... Um, by the template. On the right side, A equal depth of frame rebate up to ceiling. So you can see your A dimension, which is the face of the frame to the face of your stop, including whatever gasket you have there. Very important. That's your A dimension. 
your B dimension. What's your B dimension? Thickness of the door leaf. First door rebate. A minus B plus 4 is dimension X. Hmm. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> um, let's see here now. What are we dealing with? So I did have to put a call into the factory to find out the definition of the B dimension. Thickness of the door leaf. Resp first door rebate. <clears throat> what they're basically saying is it's a rabbited edge. <clears throat> um, what they're meaning is You can have a door that has a rabbited edge, like this. So if you've got a rabbited edge, you're going to have to take that into account when you're machining this material. Thickness of the door leaf, you know, accounting for a rabbited edge. Now here in, apparently in Europe, it's very common. In the United States, it's not uncommon. Pardon me. Here in the United States, it's not unheard of, but I would say that it's uncommon. That's what a meeting style would look like of a pair of rabbited edge doors. You will see them, especially in older, I mean like significantly older construction, construction that's from the 19th century, you'll certainly see that. So if you've got a rabbited edge, you know, and because these this is a German company, you could certainly bump into it. Now calculating when you look at that cross section you got a four millimeter dimension from the face of the door to the inside of your pocket you can make the x dimension on the frame side identical this hinge is meant for that if you want to increase that or decrease that a little bit you can you can inset it but this hinge is really intended because the logic is when you have a wall of doors or a door some people want that door to blend in melt away, disappear. And if you have an inset condition where your door is inset ever so slightly, it will certainly call more attention to the door opening versus it being flush. So you want that four millimeter dimension to be on both sides, which I would expect you would for this hinge. That's how you're going to go about machining it. The result has to measure between four millimeter and no more than six. You can have that inset. Uh, Two millimeter, should you want, up to two millimeter. So that dimension, that uh, testament there basically tells us, yes, flush condition, not to exceed a two millimeter inset. Uh, that I think really brings us to conclusion in terms of the fitting and installation for that. Let's move on to the uh, conversation regarding adjustments. Um, the adjustment paperwork for this hinge is not difficult, but did for me require a little, uh, two read-throughs, because a 3D um, adjustable hinge uh, is not necessarily something that you end up bumping into, right? So let's take a look here and find the installation instructions on their adjustments. There is a document called, uh, on the fitting instructions, it's, it's there. Okay, so let's take a closer look at that. Okay, now, adjustments. Infinitely variable 3D adjustment. You're gonna need a four millimeter Allen wrench. I've got my trusty four millimeter right here. Does not come with one. Um, <clears throat> the screws that you see in the frame that they refer to as screws, well they call them out I think as one, but these two screws that are going to be on the frame, these are going to be able to help you with your height adjustment and your depth adjustment, one and then the other. 
the number three screw they refer to here is your side adjustment. And let's, let's demonstrate that. They define the adjustments on the fitting And they do so, they do so, of course, in the installation instructions that are included, which are here somewhere. Oh, <laughs> okay. So they do call it out in the installation instructions. Actually, they call it out here in the installation instructions. Let's go. Let's go over it. First of all, they talk about a height adjustment. Okay. After you get the hinge applied to the door and frame, and the door is actually hung, if you need to adjust the height of the door, you can. Here's the first step. Put a wedge underneath the door so that it can't move. That has to be your first step. You'll see why in a moment. Then you're supposed to loosen the screws. When you loosen those screws, all of a sudden, this all becomes loose. And that's why you put the, the uh, wedge underneath. You don't want your door to uh, fall. You'll then position your door vertically, shim your door, retighten your screws. Now you've got an adjustment of the door. If I could hold these both together. Anyway, you get my point. You now have adjustment. I can move my door up and down. By the amount of margin that's in that yolk, er, yolk area of where the screws are going in and out, and I believe they say that to be three millimeter. I don't see where it's called out, but I read that somewhere. Oh, no, it says max. Max three millimeter. Uh, we'll see if we can dig up where that's called out. So now we can adjust the height. Then you can adjust the side adjustment. Adjust the adjusting spindles using the Allen key. Twist left towards the hinge, maximum three millimeter. Twist right towards the lock, maximum three millimeter. They're basically telling you, and I'm going to tighten these screws back up so my little mounting tabs don't move on me. Here and here. When I affect... I want you to just study this area in here. As I affect a change on this adjusting screw, I am literally moving the body of the hinge relative to its mounting. So I've sucked it all the way up. Now if I turn it counterclockwise, I'm drawing it back out. So the lateral movement is where I'm taking the door within the rabbit or the pocket of the door frame, and I'm moving it. And you're able to do that with all three of these hinges, with, with, with all of your hinges. So you're able to move this assembly in relationship to its mounting, the entire inner assembly. You can move that in and out. Now, in terms of the uh, depth adjustment, a little harder to understand, you're going to loosen the fixing screws. The fixing screws are the fasteners used to attach the door to the frame. You will then put the door into the correct position and then tighten the clamping screws. That's going to allow you to move this plate 
relative to what it's clamped to. Just bear with me. You can remove that plate relative to what it's being bolted to. After you then secure your fixing screws again, you then tighten up your clamp screws. Is that what, again, they call them? Your clamping screws. And that will reposition you on the frame side. And that's how, that, that's how the adjustment works. Um, I can tell you that the people who install these continue to order them over and over again. I think they do all the hard work of learning how the hinge works initially and then are able to monetize that knowledge moving forward so they continue to use it. Uh, moving on, I want to talk about the load capacity of the hinge. And let's go over that next. There is a link... on the manufacturer's page that allows us to review the load. We've got hinge overview, we've got hinge models, bear with me, 526. Now looking for the load data, we came up with the document that does have an overview of load values under load capacities. And there should be a link below this video as well to that for hinges. So the TE-526, there is a table or a chart that gives us kilograms slash weight um, given the height and the width of the door. So I'm used to dealing in inches, so I'm going to look at something that's 36 wide and something that's 84 tall. I'm going to be in the first column, I'm going to be in the fifth row from the top, and I'm at 264 pounds. Okay, I need to get, and that's just for, that's with, again, two hinges. And being a German company, they just really fill you with data. Um, you can see how your height and your width will change. Follow that guide. That load capacity will then talk about all of the different hinges. And realistically, if you're dealing with 3070 doors and they're not, well, assuming you're not dealing with 4 foot by 8 foot 14 gauge hollow metal doors, I'm certainly not going to be concerned about bumping into the load capacity of, of a pair of these hinges. Um, I don't recall what 14 gauge steel weighs per square foot, but that's just an easy search. So the bottom line is know your door weight, proceed accordingly. Um, if you're dealing with an American market, you're really going to be expected to put top, middle, bottom. If it's European, top, top, bottom. Um, we do like to see things installed in the middle. I don't think I have been instructed, I've been trained that it is not more efficient from a, a mechanical perspective, um, but it's just what we do here. So proceed accordingly. Now let's talk about the finishes. Not a lot to talk about, and we did already because this is the stainless only satin, polished, or colored. If you're dealing with other Tectus hinges now, you're going to be able to get into a lot of different finishes available. Um, and they have their own system. F1, I won't list them all, but satin chrome, satin nickel, stainless steel look, rustic, well, let's, rustic umber, let's just list them. Rustic umber, bronze metallic, gray metallic, matte deep black, traffic white, polished brass, polished nickel, satin nickel, brush chrome, bronze finish, light bronze finish and dark bronze finish. I would refer you to their, the manufacturer site so that you can physically look at those. Um, it would be certainly nice. What I was saying is it would be nice if they just had our BHMA numbers or our ANSI BHMA numbers or our US numbers. Um, you know, who's to say that polished nickel 038 is actually you know, 618 finish.
you know, polished nickel or US, you know, 14. Who's, who's to say we want things to all match up? But um, anyway, that chart is available on their website. Um, now, there's also documentation regarding maintenance. And the bottom line with maintenance is there is no maintenance. Uh, is, is that hallmark. They, uh, choosing stainless steel, yeah, according to the, to the manufacturer, you've, you've selected a high-class product, um, which guarantees longevity and timeless elegance. Um, under normal environmental impact, that uh, you can have staining to your finish, especially in industrial congested areas or near coastal areas, deposits like flash rust may occur which can affect the material in the interest of ensuring a long life of your stainless steel door hinge they strongly recommend a regular cleaning with a commercially available cleansing agent tests have been shown that referring to cleaning efficiency conservation and easy application good results can be achieved with products like and they list products that are there the only one that i am aware of is or familiar with is 3m these other companies must be are very likely European in origin. By no means steel wool, wire brushes, or the similar are to be used for cleaning since they're going to bottom line scratch the product. Um, when they say no maintenance, they mean don't get in here, don't do anything here. Whatever these bushings are here, those puppies are made to carry the weight of the hinge and they're made to do so in such a way that there's no reason for them to ever need to be lubricated. Cleaning the outside surface to prevent degradation, I would guess, is like keeping your car cleaned and washed, if that's an analogy. You know, keep it clean and then you won't have a problem. That would be my thought on that. In conclusion, um, here in the United States, I personally historically have not done a lot of hinges uh, that are European in origin. And that's probably just because a result of my client base is accustomed to our standards that are here. Um, I can tell you that there are times when I will use the, this hinge or its ilk because there is literally no other option. In the job I mentioned earlier where I needed to hide those hinges and do it all in such a way that, per, that permitted me to apply um, uh, the um, uh, work, the laminate, that we were applying to the face of the door and frame required it. Uh, we had to be able to hide the hardware. Um, I've done jobs, same application, where there was literally pieces of granite that have been applied to the door and frame, and that all needs to blend perfectly away. And you're not going to use a butt hinge in that instance. So they most certainly have their place. Uh, I've done jobs also where we've used overhead stops with a hinge like this. Um, with a, and I'm drawing your attention to the pin, what would be the vertical axis of pivoting, with a butt hinge, that vertical axis of pivoting doesn't move. It's plumb bob straight. Well, as I rotate this hinge, keep your eye on here. As I rotate this hinge, that vertical axis of pivoting really floats, doesn't it? It is not in a consistent place. When you use other hardware, namely overhead stops, you must notify the factory of the, the manufacturer of the overhead stop that you require a special template that you're saying, I'm using X company, XYZ, their model overhead stop with Tectus TE526, because they're going to provide you, probably at an upcharge, a template that's going to say, okay, here's where you position it, which is not the same as where you would with a butt hinge. It's not really too far off, but you sure don't want to use the wrong template when you're installing this material, uh, all of your hardware. And indeed, um, believe you me, that you need to have the right template for installing that material. Uh, outside of that, I find uh, that most of these hinges are generally in stock. 316, they're not in stock. That's going to be made to order. This order took every bit of... The factory originally quoted six weeks, then came back and said 10 weeks, ultimately got them to us in seven weeks. You see the point. 
permit ample time because without hinges, you're not going to hang your doors. And there's really no temporaries to use usually with such a hinge. Finally, there's a link below this video to the manufacturer's page where you can pull up not only all of the Tectus products that we sell, but a link to the manufacturer's website, as well as a link to the full product catalog. If you have any questions on the Tectus, TE 526 3D and a 316 stainless, or any other Tectus Simon Work product, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you.